So welcome to the first episode of Talks for a Magical Monday, a weekly podcast with the Heralds of the Gospel. I'm your host, Brother Gustavo, and for those who are not familiar with the Heralds, the Heralds of the Gospel are a community active in the Catholic Archdiocese of Toronto, as well as across Canada, evangelizing through goodness, truth, and beauty. Founded by Monsignor Juan Cladias, the Heralds comprise priests, brothers, sisters, and lay people since their pontifical recognition in 2001 by Pope John Paul II. And for those who are familiar with the Heralds, at this point you must be wondering, what is this Brother Gustavo doing now on a podcast in this talks for a magical Monday sounding quite unlikely to the regular Heralds content, right? So let me explain. The Heralds host a weekly rosary at St. Patrick's Parish in Schomburg, Ontario, followed by a 15-minute talk on various topics, sharing encouraging and consoling thoughts precisely geared to that unwelcome Monday that most of the times means a dreaded beginning of a probably hard week ahead. So during the talks, we used to call them messy Mondays, but the term was not elegant, not uh, quite heralds-like. So some with a mix of humor and sarcasm suggested to call them magical Mondays. And at that moment, the idea came to mind. Sounds like a good podcast name. Why not calling it Talks for a Magical Monday? We could share the talks with those who couldn't attend the rosary, and so here we go. As I said, welcome to the first episode, but if you had a tough day, plenty of crosses and hardships, if you are now commuting or doing chores, take heart and enjoy today's talk recorded live at St. Patrick's Parish in Schomburg, Ontario. The topic, The Three Gifts of the Magi Kings, a thought applicable to the whole year, by Brother Justin Bonnell. Welcome then to Talks for a Magical Monday, the weekly podcast of the Heralds of the Gospel. So today it's beautiful to have everyone together, but it's even more interesting the fact that we're in a new decade. A new year, a new decade. I know that's a dad joke, right? But uh, it's very true. I told someone today that I hadn't seen them for a decade, and they looked at me like, uh, yeah, you're right. So in our last decade, we were talking about the temperaments, right, based on the Greek concept of the four temperaments, and with those temperaments and how we should make our resolutions. Today, I'm going to kind of flip the script a bit, because today's the sixth of January, and the whole world, except for Canada, it seems, we're, we're, we are a distinct society in more ways than we, w- we wish to acknowledge, but also in so many ways which are not so good. We're one of the few countries in the world that only have two days of obligation. They got two days. And do you know how many Catholics actually make it to both days of obligation? Don't answer the question. It's poor. Really poor. And the worst thing about it is that we don't have some of the more complicated days. We don't have like the 15th of August, the middle of your summer vacation. No, we have Christmas and New Year's. We can't make it out. But today I'm going to talk about the wise men. The rest of the world, mostly the Spanish-speaking world, today is the Christmas of consumerism. Today is when you get your gifts. You don't get them on Christmas. And it comes from a very logical reason. And the reason is this, is that Christ didn't get anything. So why should you? Makes sense. So what we have is we have the three wise men. Now, I could really fall into a rabbit hole at this moment of the symbolic value of the three wise men. Firstly, who were these people? Were there three? That's another problem. And there's all kinds of theories out there. One of the more beautiful ones, and I'm going to take from this one because it's not mine, and it's from St. Um, Saint Jerome. And of course, it was contradicted by St. Augustine. Because if you know one thing about these two great saints, doctors of the church, also fathers of the church, was that they hated each other. True. Couldn't get along. And the Pope at that time was also a saint. And he forbid each of them to cross the Nile River. Not allowed to cross the Nile because under the pain of excommunication, because he knew what would happen. 
Uh, Augustine was North African, fiery temperament, uh, would brook no one who would oppose him. And Jerome was Croatian, and that was it. The two just couldn't see eye to eye on anything. But this point is very interesting, is that the three wise men, as St. Jerome would say, is a symbol of the others, the other children of Noah. We know that Sem is where the Jewish people came from, would be the father of the Egyptians, and always look poorly upon. And Jepha would be of the others. So the three kings are traditionally descendants of Ham and of the other people. On the 25th, the Jewish people were not ready. The visit of the Lord came. The long expected of nations arrived. And they were too concerned with their little lives. The star which attracted these people from afar, they didn't even know was in the sky. How many times in our own lives are we very similar to those Jews of Jerusalem which have these moments, these moments of visitation in which we do not see the Lord's hand coming? So much so that Herod calls, Herod who is not a Jew, he's an Edomite, he's from a people which are down, far down towards, towards the Indian Ocean. And there were people that were taken over by, by King David, but were not Jewish people. And he calls the high priests and everyone says, tell me, where's this Messiah supposed to be born? And they're very clear. Bethlehem of Judea. And it'll be signs like this and that and that. He's like, oh, okay. And then he talks to the kings and the kings are like, oh dear, we're, these are matching up. But all the learned had no idea. So the first point for us to look at this epiphany is if I spiritually in this Christmas season, which is coming to an end, could I be one of the kings? Would I be one of the attendants who left everything and went in search for the Messiah? Or would I be one of those people who was counting their coins in the treasury of the temple? or dusting off my manuscripts, making sure they were in perfect condition without actually reading what they had. The next point is, is when the kings come, they come with a multitude of elements. They come with riches. And the three ones that we know about are gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There are volumes written about the value of these gifts. Firstly, Financially speaking, they were extremely expensive. These gifts would have made anyone a very wealthy person by themselves. According to Anne, Blessed Anne Catholic Emmerich, Our Lady accepted the gifts and would give them to people who were in greater need than themselves. So she was constantly giving charitably to others along the way. And one of such to receive such a gift was the mother of the future Demas, who would die on a cross beside Christ. So this encounter, the three kings come, and now we know from the, if you remember from the reading, they come to the house. They don't come to the cave, right? And that's one of those points where like, mm, go to, our, go to our, our biblical sources and you'll see they arrived at the house. Why? Joseph's family was from Bethlehem. And once all the commotion had, was over, they found better logic. But can you imagine these kings that saw the star and they were imagining the king of the Jews, the only one in the ancient world which adored one God in which their God intervened in their history in ways that were powerful and that were sudden. And it was the scourge of all their enemies. They were always scared of when the Jewish people were on the ascendancy because their God fought with them. Unlike their demons, as Lewis would tell us in the Chronicles of Narnia. Their demons do no good. Only Aslan does good. They arrive and they do homage. This homage was not that of Anglo-Saxon era homage in which placing one's hands inside the hands of someone else and ple pledging oneself to be one's man. This was an act of adoration. They acknowledged him as God. Now, one of the beautiful things as Christians, we have the ability because of our philosophical background of actually understanding 
a very difficult thing that would have been for first century Jews, which is the role of paradoxes. Things that are like confused and contradictory, but true. We can thank our Greek heritage in the faith for this ability to understand the role of paradox. A child, weak, poor, etc., etc., but at the same time who is God, King, and Master. That paradox is prevalent throughout our whole salvation story. Actually, if you look within our own spiritual lives, it's very present also. Now let's get to our three gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. In our encounter with God, our way of walking that trip towards the star, toward that encounter with Christ, we are asked many times to offer the best of ourselves. We're asked to give what hurts. We're asked to give what we're never going to get back. Sometimes that's years, that's time, sometimes that's talent. Sometimes it's things more tangible. In the same way, the kings gave gold. We know one thing now, that gold isn't native to our planet. It comes from an asteroid or somewhere else, and that's why it's so rare. Unlike what the media has and the marketing departments have done with diamonds, which makes diamonds look as though that they are amazing, but incredibly common. Gold is not common. Gold has value. When we have our encounter, that visitation of the Lord, that gold, that little bit that we have, which is so precious, which is heated, cleansed, all of its, all of its useless elements are burnt away through years of suffering. When we present that to the Lord, we hope that it is pure and it in its highest carat possible. And that's why it's fit for kings. It's fit for God. Our sacrifices, ourselves, we are fit for God. We are co-heirs of the kingdom. We are called to be images of God. Satan, in the first book in the Bible, in Genesis, he attempts to steal the image of God through the sin of Adam and Eve. But the image of God comes back and looks towards each one of us and asks us, do you want to be my image? It's a good question to ask ourselves in this Christmas season. Are we images of God? That gold which we have in our hearts, is it gold or is it full of trust? And, and and useless alloys. Our next king comes up and offers frankincense. Frankincense, which is a very rare incense of worship, of something which is due to God. Our lives are called through our baptism to be priest, prophet, and king. But do our lives burn like frankincense in front of God? Do our prayers rise up to God, pure and unadulterated? Or are our prayers filled with self, either despair, self-love, and other miscellaneous things? If the gold is pure, so should our prayer be. Our acknowledging God as who he is and loving him because of who he is, not because of something we can get on the side. And lastly... And this sounds the weirdest one. Myrrh was this very precious ointment that was used upon the bodies of the dead. And it was used only for those who had means because it kept their bodies together longer. And it was a way in which the family could, um, could celebrate the various commemorative ceremonies with a body that was still recognizable. But ourselves, we can offer our own fragility as being humans, our own mortality to God as an offering. The aches and pains of days, our sicknesses, are, are many elements that we end up with as the years go on. We can offer that on the altar of our life to God. We look at, again, Genesis, and we see Cain and Abel. Abel offers his best, but offers it totally. Cain, on the other hand, offers it halfway. I'll give him my second class. Not my first class. I'm going to keep this stuff for me. But when we do that, God looks at it and goes, ah, keep it all. St. John Bosco uses a term which was a little bit more easy to comprehend. He says many times we go to God with our problems or with sacrifices. And we say, Lord, take. And when the Lord takes, he perceives your hands are still clinging onto it. And he goes, let go. No. 
then keep it. It's not accepted. Why? Because of our attachment to it. Our attachment to life ends up putting us in a position where we do what we don't want to do. We want to, we want to do this good, but then we end up destroying the good by some other selfish act. So the three kings offer these three beautiful items, three gifts that we too can offer in our own individual lives. The problem is, are we wanting to? The three kings, tradition has it, became apostles, became those sent. And they began to establish communities in their own places, awaiting the proclamation of the gospel. Today, the relics of the three kings are found in Cologne Cathedral in Germany. World Youth Day, I think it was 2008, with Pope Benedict was held in that historic city. So let's ask these three saints who allowed themselves, abandoned themselves to grace, to do the insane so that we too can become even greater. But not in the sense of pride and, 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 and valor and show off, no. But greater in the sense of our understanding of what we're doing to give ourselves what we need. But it sounds like too much. It really does. It's too much. So the solution for this is who the kings went to. They didn't go directly to the infant Jesus and offer the gifts. No, they went to Our Lady. And Our Lady was the one who made the intercession. And we too should do the same. We should go to Our Lady, ask her intercession. You know, I, I've got this piece of gold. It's kind of like eight carat gold. Kind of like six, maybe. It's got some alloys in there, but... It's got good intentions. It's got hope. Can you do something to it? Can you put it in a nice box? Because it's uh, my box fell in the mud. I've got this muddy box. And Our Lady is our mother, and she will take it, clean it up, decorate it properly, and make it something worthwhile. She does that when we offer, through her intercession to the Lord, our merits, sacrifices, and prayers. She takes them and cleanses them of the defects which we unfortunately had. If you want to put it in European ways, it's the VAT tax, the value added tax we stick on. That's useless. So let's ask Our Lady today in this this last bit of Christmas before we enter ordinary time so that we can be like the king or in their entourage and that when we see the baptism of the Lord, we can be a part of those followers of John that immediately cling to the Lord, not the followers of John that begin to plot the crucifixion of the Lord. Let's say, a th- let's say three Hail Marys. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, which is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Our Lady, Queen of Hearts, in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And this is all for today's episode recorded live from St. Patrick's Church in Schomburg, Ontario. You can reach us anytime at one of the Herald's websites, such as heralds.ca forward slash podcast, New Insights Multimedia forward slash podcast, or you can also subscribe on iTunes or anywhere you normally listen to your favorite podcast. And as per now, pray hard, work hard, keep growing in devotion to the Eucharist and our Blessed Mother, evangelize by word and example, and be every day more and more a real herald of the Gospel. Oh,